What does that even mean, Bowers Game Cardinar? Ahoy there, YouTube! I'm back again today for another game review, another special expansion review. And today, I'm very excited to check out Twilight Imperium: The Shattered Empire expansion. This is for up to eight players. It will take you a long freaking time to play. It's for ages, I don't know, 14 and up. Uh, if you're brave enough to play with a teenager. And as many of you know, Twilight Imperium is the epic space opera in which you are going to be flying around the galaxy, fighting, conquering different races, upgrading technology, doing all sorts of good sort of spacey stuff. This is the expansion which is going to add more, 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 more. More modules, more cards, more planets, more races, more of a little bit of everything. So I'm going to go into the middle part and I'm going to give a very lengthy 20 minutes, I believe it is, uh, explanation of what all you're going to get and it'll go a little bit of depth into everything and then I will give you my thoughts at the end. So let's go ahead and check it out. All right, then we're going to be taking a look at Twilight Imperium Shattered Empire expansion. This is the first expansion to Twilight Imperium. Uh, I'm going to be going over all the different modules and everything you're going to be getting in here. I'm going to be trying to go a little bit thorough so you can get a real in-depth look at what you're going to get. So first and foremost, we have a handy-dandy rule booklet. It is very well done, obviously. Uh, that's kind of a, a big deal with a game like this. It'll have you up and running in no time at all. Uh, actually, that's a lie. It won't, but you're going to be uh, coming back to it quite frequently for, like, minor rule things. Uh, but it still is very well done. So in this game, you're going to be getting a lot of different stuff. I'll talk about some of the housekeeping stuff first. You're going to be replacing a lot of old tech cards. Uh, the big addition, one of the big additions, is you're going to be getting two completely new colors with orange and with gray. And you're going to get everything you need for that. Uh, so that's really cool. And I really do like both those colors. They definitely stand out on the board, which is nice. I wish bright orange was a routine color. You're also going to be getting four new tech cards that everyone's going to go. And I'll go over those real quick so you can get a, a gander at them. So this one is Hyper Metabolism. During each status phase, you gain one additional command counter. That is, that's pretty useful. In addition, before drawing action cards, you may discard one action card from your hand to draw an additional card. That's a really nice one. Uh, next, we have the Nanotechnology. Uh, your Dreadnoughts and War Suns may not be targeted by your opponent's action cards. In addition, when you claim a planet, you gain its planet card refreshed. Wow, that's another really good one as well. Uh, we have the Maneuvering Jets. Your opponent receives minus one to all PDS roll targets uh, your ships, or minus two if it is firing from adjacent system. In addition, you receive minus one to all your space mine rolls. Uh, so this one is really good, especially if you plan on going on the offensive with someone who has a PDS. Last but not least, we have the Automated Defense Turrets. All your destroyers receive plus two and roll one additional die on anti-fighter barrage rolls. So that one's really good one as well, which could potentially impact how you play. So, in addition to those four new techs, you're also going to get four brand spanking new races, and we'll go over those so you can uh, you can get a feel for those. So first we have the Yin Brotherhood, and I'll read off their special abilities. Before an invasion combat, which you are the attacker, begins, you may roll one die. On a five plus, your opponent loses one ground force, and you gain one ground force. Also, immediately before the second round of a space battle, you may discard one of your participating destroyers or cruisers to choose one opposing ship present and immediately afflict one hit on it. Yes, that means a war sun could be half dead. Uh, so that's really useful as well. Once per turn, as an action, you may place your control marker on an unexhausted planet card you control. Until the end of the round, its influence and resource values are reversed. So, for instance, if you got one of those pesky 0-3s, you can turn that into a 3-0. So that can be pretty useful from time to time. Continuing onward, we have the Embers of Muact. Your War Suns have a base movement of 1. This improves to 2 when you acquire the Deep Space Cannon technology. So that kind of stinks a little bit. As an action, you may spend 1 Command Counter from your Strategy Allocation Area to place 2 Free Fighters or 1 Free Destroyer destroyer in any one system containing one of your war suns or space docks. Your ships may move through but not end their movement in supernova systems. Now you're like, why would I possibly want this guy? Well, let's focus on one thing right here. Yeah, you start with a war sun. That's, that's pretty dang powerful. 
Uh, continuing onward, we have the Clan of Sar, which is definitely one of the more interesting ones, and this is actually one that they recommend new people not play with. So you're going to gain one trade good every time you acquire a new planet, so obviously you're going to want to take a lot of new planets. Your space docks are going to be able to move. They're going to have a movement of one. That's kind of crazy. Now, you can't move and activate, though. Uh, that'd just be move and build, I should say. That'd be kind of OP. But still, very, very powerful. You're just going to be essentially dragging along everything you have because you're going to be able to fill objectives even if you don't control your home system. So you're just going to be roaming all around the galaxy. Spoiler, I really like this one. It's really unique. And last, we have the Winu, who I feel is just really well-balanced and powerful. Uh, so they have three completely different abilities. You may always add the influence value of your home system planet to your votes, even if it's exhausted, so that's very, very useful. Your planets that contain at least one ground force are immune to the local unrest action card, so that's, that's okay. And you do not need to spend a command counter to execute the secondary ability of the technology strategy. Yeah, that means you are going to be balling up on technology as long as you save up what you need to save up on. Now, one more other cool thing about the Windu that I wanted to point out before we get into the different modules and different components is that they are actually going to be the first home race that is actually going to start with a yellow tech. Now, this doesn't count to objectives or anything like that, but that means that all your yellow is going to be one cheaper for the entire game as long as you have your home world. So that is a very cool ability. So now we're going to go over all the different uh, all the different modules that you're going to get here, and I am going to be going through the rulebook to do this so I don't miss anything. So the big one that I want to get to is obviously going to be the new strategy cards. And this is what most people, me included, thought was the weakest element of the old game. Now, they actually include two. I'm going to start with eight. And most people who play Twilight Imperium know exactly why I'm starting with eight. Because eight, in my opinion, uh, was broken in the last game. So they give you a new one, Imperial 2, which I like a lot better. So during an, uh, so it used to be you'd get two victory points, just for, or you get a, the points just for taking it. Now, uh, if you control Mo Megatol Rex, you're going to be able to get one victory point, and you can also, uh, you can qualify pu public objectives. Uh, you also get to do, execute the secondary ability for free, and that is going to let you spend a command counter from your strategy allocation area to build at one of your space stocks, even if it is already activated. So that can be very, very useful. Uh, but other than that, we'll start from one, and I'll go down the list. And uh, I'm still being thorough, so why not? We'll just be thorough, and I'll show you all of them. So next, we have leadership. You're going to receive three command counters. This is really, really useful. Also, you can do the secondary ability, which is going to allow you potentially to get three more command counters if you're willing to spend the influence. You spend the influence, uh, and if you have six influence, you can play this essentially gaining six command counters, which is going to give you a lot of wiggle room. I really like that one, uh, but that's a spoiler. I'm not talking about my opinions here, right? Yeah. Uh, so next we have Diplomacy 2. This one is going to allow you, uh, this one's a little bit interesting, choose one system containing a planet you control. Each opponent must place one of his command counters on the system from his reinforcement. That means no one can attack it, which was kind of like what the old one did. Uh, you also have the option to execute the secondary ability of this card without paying a command counter. Now, the secondary ability is going to allow you to spend a command counter, but obviously if you pick this, you would have to, uh, from your strategy allocary location area and three influence to claim an empty planet adjacent to a system you control. Place your control marker on the planet. So that one can be really, really useful, especially if you're not playing with the distant suns, which I'll get to in a few minutes. So next, we'll get to number three, which is the assembly. Now, here's how the assembly works. You're going to get a political card, and then you're going to take two action cards, which are two very good things. Now, you, then you're going to have the option to do either A or B. So if you do A, you are going to claim the speaker token, which means you'll go first. Uh, you'll get to pick first next round. And then you get to pick someone else to play a political card, at which point you'll vote on the political card, which as many people know will take quite a while sometimes. Uh, and then... Or you can do B, so you can choose one other player to claim the speaker token, a.k.a. you can pick the person to your immediate right, so you'll go second, and then you get to play a political card if you have one that you're, you particularly like. Secondary ability is a pretty good one in my opinion. You spend one command counter from your strategy allocation area to refresh any number of your planet cards with total combined resources and influence of six or less. So if this is played uh, near the middle after you've spent a lot of those, this could be a really powerful one right there. Uh, moving on to number four, we have production. 
production is going to allow you to immediately build units in one of your systems containing one or more friendly space stocks, receiving two additional resources for which to build. Which is great. I mean, you're already going to start with two. Even if you have activated the system already, building units does not activate the system. So essentially, this is a free build without having to use one of your command counters. Also, you're going to have two bucks that you don't have to spend, which is great. Secondary ability is very similar and it's very useful in certain situations. Spend a command counter from your strategy allocation area to immediately build up to three units in one of your systems containing one or more friendly space stocks, even if you have already activated. So you spend a command counter and you'll still be able to build stuff. So that is the production. Moving on to the trade. This one does not have a secondary ability. It's going to allow you to receive three trade goods or cancel up to two trade agreements. Now, everyone's going to receive their trade goods. Uh, everyone aside from you is going to receive one fewer trade goods, and then you're going to be able to open up the market to more trade agreements, and you can veto everything you want. Moving on to Warfare 2, and many people had problems with Warfare 1. They tried to fix it with Warfare 2. Uh, so you're going to have a high alert token, which I actually don't have out with me, but it's a little round token. You're going to place this token in a system. Your ships in the system with a token gain plus one movement and plus one on all combat rolls. If you move any ships from the system, you may move the token with them. So they're going to be able to move further and hit harder. Remove the token from the board at the start of the next status phase because someone else is obviously going to take it. Now the secondary ability is going to let you spend one command counter and then you're going to be able to move up to two of your ships from unactivated systems into an adjacent system you control. Uh, so that also does not activate the system. Moving on to 7, and then we'll get to 8, because that's how counting work. We have Technology 2. You're going to receive a Technology Advance. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh... Uh, but the thing is, you may also buy a second technology advance at the cost of eight resources. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty nice. Now the secondary ability, you're, you're all pretty familiar with that. You're going to spend one command counter, then you pay six, and you'll be able to receive a technology. So yeah, pretty self-explanatory there. Finally, we, last, we have bureaucracy, which is going to get you a lot of objectives on the board. Special, after selecting this strategy card you're going to reveal cards from the objective deck equal to the number of bonus counters on this card because if no one picks it then it gets a bonus counter at the end uh and then the, you get the primary ability you receive one command counter from your reinforcements then draw the top two cards from the objective deck place one face down uh, face up in the common area and the other one on top of the deck you may immediately claim one public objective that's a big thing if you qualify for it so if you know you're going to qualify for something say mid-round uh, especially if it's like a secret object or something, boom, you play this, and then boom, you can do it. So that's pretty useful. Uh, last but not least, secondary ability, you spend one command counter from your strategy allocation area to draw one political card and one action card. So those are going to be the new strategy cards, and hopefully everything else will go a little bit quicker than that. Um, so next we have uh, some new objective cards. I'm not going to go too much into detail of these because I'm going to try and hit on some other stuff. But these actually kind of promote warfare a little bit more. A uh, little less turtling, a little more attacking. They'll have you going to various different places around the galaxy, which is obviously, obviously going, to, uh, going to have more consequences when they end in battle. So you have new public objective cards and new public uh, objective cards stage two. Now it doesn't say anything in the rule booklet about mixing and matching, but I personally like a little bit better where you use some from the old and some from the new. Uh, I'm sure there's probably a reason why you shouldn't do that, but it seemed fine to me. Uh, also, you're gonna get some new secret objective cards, so that's pretty nice. Uh, just more cards is always a good thing. Next, you're going to get race-specific technologies, and this gets me excited because everybody's getting a new race-specific technology. I'm not gonna go through all of them just because, you know, I've already at the 12-minute mark, but we'll go through a couple of them. Uh, so this one, Diplomat, it's gonna cost you five resources. So what this means is, uh, even if you were, say, so let's say you're doing the secondary ability on attack and you have to pay six, you have to pay five in addition to that six, so this is a very expensive one. Once per turn, when an opponent activates the system you control, you may spend a command counter from your strategy allocation area to force him to instead place the command counter into his reinforcements and immediately end his actions. What?! Yeah, that one is really good if you don't want to get attacked, but it is very expensive. This one is also going to cost 5. Your War Sons now have plus 1 movement and a base cost of 10 resources. Yeah, so your War Sons are going to be going 3 spaces and only costing 10. Uh, so next we have the Telepathic Mind Weapon. This one's also going to go cost 5. They don't all cost 5. 
When your opponent activates a system that you control, he immediately loses one command counter from his fleet supply area or his race sheet. And one thing I like about this is if you have this, you can be like, hey, don't forget this. If you come here, you're going to lose stuff. Uh, so I like that little mind game there. Uh, we'll do two more. we got the L4 Disruptors. This one's going to cost six. Very, very expensive. But you may use your race's special ability during invasion combat without paying any trade goods. Uh, so, yeah. So, we'll do one more. We have... This one's only going to cost you three resources. But in action, you may spend one command counter from your strategy allocation area to gain six trade goods. You must then give two of your trade goods to another player. You may only do this once per turn, and only if you have fewer than six trade goods. So you're going to be giving four to people, you're going to be giving people money, but it, you're still going to be getting a bunch of money. So those are going to be race-specific tech cards. Whichever race you get is going to have one of those that you will have the option to build. So next, we're going to have artifacts, which are going to be spread throughout the galaxy, and players will take turns actually spreading these throughout the galaxy. And... Uh, these are essentially going to be moving victory points because people will be able to take them over. And when you uh, it, so essentially they're going to go all face up like that. They're going to be placed all around the galaxy. When you get there, you take it over. You're going to flip it over, and if you are able to successfully get that, then boom, you are going to have one victory point closer to winning the game. But if someone else takes over that same spot, then they are going to take the victory points. So they're traveling victory points. Kind of a unique idea in the game. Uh, another way to get points, which is always a good thing as well. Moving on to the next one, we're going to have the Shock Troopers. Now, the Shock Troopers are uh, going to be ground units, but they are much, much more powerful ground units. Now, these guys are going to be very difficult to get because you either have to roll a 10 when you are attacking, uh, when you're attacking with ground forces, or you're going to have certain planets. And I have them somewhere here. I'm going to pause real quick and find them. Bingo, we found it. So, uh, you can roll a 10 for your fighters, or you can take over a planet that has this symbol right here. Now, if you refresh this card, which means you essentially don't use it, uh, you can put those shock troopers there. Now, the shock troopers are pretty powerful. They're going to have some really cool special abilities, uh, and they're going to be a lot more powerful than just your base ground units. For starters, they uh, their, their base combat is 5 instead of uh, 8, I believe it is. But they are very, very good, so that's pretty much the main thing there. Next, you're going to have Space Mines, which are a really unique thing right here. Uh, they're going to go down there, and they are only going to be able to be made by the cruisers, which normally uh, a lot of people don't build cruisers because they cost more, and they're not terribly better than the destroyers. But this will change that, because you can go bloop, 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 kind of pooping these around the galaxy, and these could do some serious damage to people if they activate and destroy people. So essentially, they can add another layer of defense, or if you're trying to outrun somebody potentially in certain situations, which normally doesn't happen too much in the game, but it could, these are going to help you do that. Uh, next, we have the Wormhole Nexus, and this is a really unique one. Uh, this is a planet, as you can see, it's got a unique shape that you're going to be setting outside of the map, and if you can go to this through a wormhole, uh, which is going to leave you incredibly susceptible to attack, but at the same time, you will also be able to go to any wormhole in the entire galaxy from here, which means you'll be able to fly around the galaxy at very quick pace, going from one side of the map to the other using the wormholes. Also has a planet there, a 0-3 planet, so it's not particularly well, but it will give you some more uh, voting power. Continuing on, we have called facilities, and there's two kinds of facilities here. You're going to have refineries, and you're going to have colonies. Now, uh, essentially, you're going to have to pretty much give up using a planet for a turn, but if you're willing to do that, you're going to be able to put uh, a plus one on that, or a plus one on that, which can be very, very useful, especially if you do it early game. Now, you can't do this to home worlds, but you can do it to worlds right outside your home world. So if there's something that you know you're probably never going to lose, this is definitely worth considering making a purchase and putting them on there. It also helps if you get stuck with like a lot of bad planets around you to maybe beef them up just a little bit. Uh, they also did, uh, so they changed the tactical retreat rule very, very slightly, so slightly that in fact I really don't know what the big difference is, but you can still retreat. So, next we have the new Distant Sun Domain Counters, which are right here. Distant Sun is a module that was in the original, uh, where essentially you'd have these on all the different planets outside of, uh, of your homeworld, and when you went there and tried to take it over, either good or bad things would happen. Uh, and they came with four new ones, which I'll just show you on the back of here, because it's a little bit easier. 
so as you can see, the four new ones that they added are Native Intelligence, which is uh, kind of an interesting one. You're going to be able to look at any one face-down domain counter on any planet of your choice, so you'll know what's coming at you. Next, you have the Hidden Factory. You unearth an ancient, abandoned starship factory. Immediately receive any number of ships for free worth up to two resources. So hopefully you have a large fleet supply. Next, we get to the red ones, which are the bad ones. The hostage situation, which I actually think is very fun thematically, uh, means that essentially you are going to have to pay goods to, to not get your people killed, and you still are not going to be able to capture the planet. We have the automated defense system, which essentially is kind of like a PDS that is on that planet. And last but not least, we have a fighter ambush, which as you can see, you're going to have to be fighting three fighters to take control of a planet. So it really makes you think about how much that you're going to be sending at each planet when you send it. Uh, so continuing onward, uh, oh, also they kind of did some modifications to the Distant Sun so that um, the the more risky ones are on the inside. So if you want to go towards the middle of the galaxy, you're going to have to risk possibly really good rewards or really bad punishments, whereas the not-so-terrible ones are tended to be on the outside of the map. Continuing on, we have the Custodians of Mechatol Rex, which is an interesting one, which you're going to use these two guys right here. And how this is going to work is no one's just going to be taking over Mechatol Rex with a carrier and a guy anymore. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight to take over Mechatol Rex, which many people think is the way that it should be because a lot of objectives deal with Mechatol Rex. Last, you're going to have the Voice of the Council, which is something you'll be able to do per turn. It's another traveling victory point. And essentially, if you win the Voice of the Council based on voting, uh, how you do for a politics and stuff like that, you will have a victory point, but this victory point, as soon as someone else is elected, you'll lose a victory point, it will go to them, so it will be a traveling victory point. We have two more components to get to, then I'll get to my thoughts. Uh, I just want to show you some of the new tiles. There's a lot, lot, lot of new tiles, uh, so as you can see, that's the one I talked about right there that's going to have the uh, the shock troopers you can use. There's also the new Ion Storm, which is another one of the red board one, which essentially makes it so that people cannot go in there, or people can go in there, but people cannot go out there. I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, the Ion Storm is a new type of special system, and essentially PDS cannons cannot fire in there. You can enter in it, however, you may never move through it. Uh, so yeah. So essentially, you immediately just bloop, get stopped, so you have to stop there, and then you can get out a little bit later. But I'll show you some more of the new stuff right here. This is a new one right here, and I'll grab that card so you can see it. Actually, I won't. Uh, I can't find it right now, but essentially when you take this over, you're going to have this planet. But if you refresh it, you also can acquire two trade goods instead, which can be more valuable sometimes, uh, because there can be money in the long term. So these are really kind of unique. Uh, because they will give you quite a bit of trade goods if you do it every single turn or when you can. The last thing they've included in the game, I swear the last thing, are these little cheat sheet cards right here. Everyone's going to have them. And it's going to tell you the cost of all the different forces, what they actually look like. Thank you very much. And uh, their movement and their battle and some other good stuff right there. So that, in, well, not a nutshell, in a full-blown nut tree is what you're going to be getting inside of Twilight Imperium Shattered Empire Expansion. Alrighty then, Twilight Imperium Shattered Empire Expansion from Fantasy Flight Games. One of my final thoughts, go over the pros, let's go over the cons. Uh, so before we do we get started, I do want to mention that Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition is my favorite game of all time. So needless to say, I had incredibly high expectations for this. I was super excited, so take that for what you will when I'm going over my thoughts on the game. Now, normally I do the pros and the cons, but actually I'm going to go by each module and everything inside of here and give you my individual thoughts on everything. So first and foremost, 7 and 8 players. I love it. I love it. Uh, you're already committing 4 hours to this game, 3 to 4 hours to this game. What's the difference between committing more hours to it is my thought. Now, not every game. Not every game I want to be incredibly long and lengthy and epic because some games just are not like that. I don't want to play Ticket to Ride with eight people, but this is a particular game where I get more excited with the more players you add. So I was very happy about that. Also, I really like the two new colors. I love Bright Orange. Bright Orange should be a mandatory color for every game. Uh, so that is a really big thumbs up. And also, these two are very distinctive, uh, which is great, because you want the colors to be distinctive. Moving on, where they got new planets for everybody. I like the new planets. I like them a lot. I like the refresh abilities with the fighters and all the cool stuff and the trade things. So you can flip it over and get the two trade goods. Just more planets is always a good thing. Now let's get to the optional rules and the variants and the strategies and all that sort of stuff. So these new guys, the, the strategy cards that you pick at the beginning of your turn, 
I like them. I really do. I like them quite a bit. Um, I definitely think I wouldn't use all of them per se. I like the old Warfare a little bit better, but I understand that this Warfare actually is a little bit more thematic. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I can understand that. I love the new 8. I will never, ever, ever play with the old 8. I always hated the old 8. I really do. And I also like the fact that they still include uh, the a replacement for that 8 and then a completely new 8. And I do like both of those quite well, but I do like Bureaucracy a little bit better. But I understand the other one, the, I think it's the Imperial 2, does make Mechatol Rex a little bit of a bigger deal, which it should be. It's in the center of the galaxy. It should be a big deal. So overall, very happy with these, and I like the fact that you can mix and match them. So that's a big thumbs up on that. Uh, so next, we have the Variant Objectives, which are the more... Oh, yeah, yeah, these guys. So, uh... You know, this is okay. Uh, you know, some people like it because it focuses more on combat. I personally like to mix and match a little bit better. Use half and half. I don't know if you're actually supposed to do that, but I do. Uh, but more combat's never a bad thing. It does try and discourage turtling, but in a game like this, I'm not the, the biggest... I'm not the biggest enemy of turtling, but most people that I played with did like this, it did tend to, tend to make it so it was a little bit more conflict-based, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. Plus, uh, you know... It, it'll shorten the game a little bit, which is always kind of a good thing for most people. Continuing on, we have the race-specific technologies. One word, absolutely fantastic. Except, except I don't feel like all of them are as good as they should be. Uh, what, what is it? The one... The, some of them are really, really, really good, and some are like, yeah, that could be good in certain situations. Like the one uh, that gives you the war sun that, that moves faster and does is cost cheaper. That's a no-brainer. That's an insta-buy. But some of them are like, yeah, I'm probably not going to use that. So I do like them a lot, but I don't think they feel like all of them are the best balance, but they might be, because then you might have to focus in on what special abilities your race has, I would really need to play with those a lot more times to figure out if they're balanced or not, but I still like them an awful lot. Anything that makes my guys different from your guys is a great thing in this game. So I'm a big fan of the race-specific technologies. Moving on to the artifacts, I like them, but, and that's, that's one thing they're going to see with a couple of the different variants in here, if you have two of these artifacts that are close together and they happen to be the ones that have the victory points, you could have a problem because if you could potentially have, you know, two extra victory points in like a three space radius, which kind of stinks, especially if you're playing like in a big game in a galaxy, that's going to give those two players big advantages. So this is one I probably won't play with too terribly often, maybe in a smaller game, but normally I'm going to dick, ditch the artifacts just because they are a little bit too random. And speaking of random, I'll get to that a little bit. Shock Troopers, I like them. They're really cool. Don't ever think I would not play with them. When you get a Shock Trooper just randomly, it's like, what? So, wait, what can this guy do? And then you read it. And you're like, oh, this guy's awesome. I want to keep this guy alive. He's great. He's going to go around and wreck the galaxy. Now, he's not super overpowered or anything like that, but it's really cool to have that little ace up your sleeve and say, oh, I still got some Shock Troopers there. I'm good. I also like the fact that they are hard to get. You either have to get the planet that's going to let you do that or roll a 10. So I do enjoy the Shock Troopers a lot. Same with the Space Mines, even though a lot of people forget to use them. Uh, I also like the fact that they make the cruisers just a little bit. They just, the, you know, the, the, cru the cruisers needed to be just bumped up a little bit. And this does bump them up because now you have that added ability. And if somebody reminds you, be like, oh, you can put a mine behind you if you're worried about that. And, and they can help increase your defense. So I am a big fan of the space mines as well. Wormhole Nexus, brilliant. Thank you, Fantasy Flight Games. This is fantastic. I just love it. And it doesn't come into play too terribly often. But it can. Having control of this, and if you can build a space dock on this, it's like, okay. If you can start, you know, just building up troops on this, it's like, I can go wherever I want. And you're just the ultimate wild card. Like, if you can get a war sun and space docks and some stuff on this, people are like, what is he doing? He could go anywhere. And I like that an awful lot. So big fan of the Wormhole Nexus. Always play with that. Uh, the facilities... They're 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 minor, but I do like them. I, they're I, they're not something I personally remember to use too often. But some people I've seen have used them, and they they are helpful. I mean, they can help make planets that stink into planets that stink less. So that's always a good thing. So they're a nice added little addition if you can remember to use them. Uh, tactical retreats. Uh, I don't really know what's too different about the tactical retreats, but I'm glad there's retreating because sometimes you, you kind of get owned. Uh, the new distant suns domain counter. And this is one. 
uh, going back to the random. I like the idea of it, and they're fun to play with, but I don't feel like I'm going to play with them too terribly often, and just because they're way too random and swingy for my liking. Uh, the same way in the victory points can be spread around the galaxy and you don't know where they are, this is the same way. And I'll give you a perfect example. They have the new hostage situation, I'll read it out to you. So if you land on a space, your landing party is taken hostage by the local inhabitants. Pay trade goods equal to the number of ground forces that land there. And you don't get the planet. So essentially, if you say send three ground troops there, because you want to be sure that you're not going to get bombarded or anything like that, so you send three ground troops there, you are either going to A, pay three goods and get your ground troops back, or B, not pay three goods and your guys are going to die and you still won't get the planet, or, well, I guess those are the two options. Likewise, you could have potentially got the technological society, which means the player to your left is going to give you a free tech. Yes, a free tech. That is a huge difference between getting a technology and potentially losing your guys. Now, I understand it does have a risk-reward thing, but just not. Nah, it's too swingy, especially if you get to a planet with three of them on there, and there are three really good things, like you get the natural wealth, and maybe you get the Lazic survivors, then maybe you get the... the, the, the yeah, it just It's too swingy for me, too random for me. I like the idea, but no. Just know I, I probably won't play with that again unless somebody really, really wants to do that. Custodians of Mechatol Rex, I like that. I'll play with that every single time. Uh, Mechatol Rex should not be a cakewalk. Mechatol Rex should be a little bit of a challenge because it is a big focus on the game. So I like the Custodians of Mechatol Rex. It just makes it a little bit more powerful. Uh, last, we have the Voice of the Council. It's an interesting idea. It's a traveling victory point. I'm not completely against it. I'm not completely for it. That one, I'm more just kind of like, eh, whatever. Somebody wants to play with it, I will definitely play with it. Last but not least, of course, we have the three or the four new races. And to me, they're personally three new races. Uh, races. I'm not a big fan of the Yid Brotherhood. If I get it, I'll grumble a little bit. I was like, I want something cooler. Uh, but they do seem perfectly functional. I just don't particularly like their abilities too much. Now, the other three, I really enjoy their ability. The Clan of Sar is, without a doubt, probably my favorite just because it's such a unique concept that you don't have to control your home world to gain victory points. They're just like a roaming gang that literally their, their primary goal is just to roll through the galaxy. Just move the space dock through the galaxy and you just keep building up that space dock and building up your fleet supply, going through attacking, taking over planets because you're also going to gain trade goods for doing that. Uh, so they have a really cool special ability. Uh, they have a really cool ability. It's just a lot of fun to play with. Uh, next we have the Winu. I really like these guys as well, mainly because of their first and third abilities that they have, where they can use the influence value of their home planet, even if they flipped it over, so they're always going to have a little bit of influence for the votes, especially if you play with like the one where you get to play with the the voice of the council and stuff like that. You're always going to have a little bit of say in stuff, no matter what. I also like their third ability a lot, where they don't have to use a command counter in order to use the tech ability, the secondary tech ability, which is great. So that essentially means that as long as you have enough that you can buy technology, you're going to be able to do that every single time the tech comes up, uh, which will change how you play because you're going to make sure that you have that every single time because, hey, it's tech. It's going to make you better. Last, the Embers of Muat, definitely one of the most interesting ones, and definitely one that's great for early board control. I love this one for early board control because you start with a war sign, and your primary goal is probably going to be to pop one of those out early because if you can do that, nobody's coming into your territory. They don't want to get wrecked by that because most you know time early game it's maybe a couple fighters and a carrier you know who little tiddly stuff coming in there they're not going to want to mess with a war star people are going to make treaties with you people are going to be going the other way which means you'll be able to do what you want in your spot and then eventually when you do get it built up oh your war is just going to be absolutely disgusting new races big thumbs up on that so i think i covered everything in here uh so let's oh the unit reference cards freaking genius. These should have been included with the first game. These just show you actual pictures and how much they can move and what they cost. Absolutely genius. Big thumbs up on that. So, Twilight Imperium, Shattered Empire, the first expansion to Twilight Imperium. What are my final thoughts? Um, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. This is the best game of all time, in my humble opinion. This game, this expansion, makes it even better. Now, there's going to be some modules that you won't want to play with. Uh, maybe you agree with me. Maybe you'll disagree with me on a couple of them. Just throw that stuff in a bag. Throw it in the giant box, because Lord knows the old box, which 
uh, for those of you who don't remember, is absolutely gigantic, is going to fit everything, and then you'll just play with all the new stuff. Just mix it in, uh, and from time to time, whenever you want to play with the different strategy cards, you can do that, you can mix and match them. Uh, I believe there's new strategy cards in the second expansion too, which hopefully eventually I'll get and then review that for you guys as well. Uh, but, but just put simply, if you enjoy Twilight Imperium, if you play it on a routine basis, which I suppose means two or three times a year, given the, the epicness of the game, absolutely pick it up. Now, is it going to be for everybody? No. Is this going to make it for people who didn't like the original game because it was too long or something like that? No. But if your big problem with the game, and what I think was a lot of people's, well, some people's big problem was just that stupid 8 card, that old 8 strategy card that you had to take or you're going to lose the game. When I'm playing an epic 8-hour game, I don't want to have to do something. I want to do whatever the heck I want to do, and if I didn't take that, I was going to lose. Pretty much guaranteed. Uh, so they got rid of that, they fixed that, they made some things better, they made some tweaks to some technology cards, this, the tactical retreat, they added more stuff, and it just makes an expansion that you need to own if you like Twilight Imperium. So Twilight Imperium, Shadowed Empire, must own if you enjoy Twilight Imperium. That was my review for Twilight Imperium Shattered Empire, the expansion. If you enjoy this content, please be sure to click on the subscribe button down below. And needless to say, well, the rest of my views are not normally this long at all. In fact, they're probably half of this. And in the comments below, let me know, Twilight Imperium, are you pro? Are you con? Have you not played it? And also, what kind of chair do you sit at the gaming table? you have a cool chair like this that does this? Yeah, I love this. This is really cool right here. This is one of my favorite things to do at the table. You get so low and then, well, not kick the camera, and then play like this. And then I just look like really weird. I feel like a kid at the table. I got my hands up. Everything's a little secret. Yeah, I'm a little bit weird like that, but I really love this chair because it lets me do that. But, yeah, anywho, thanks for your time, YouTube. That was the review for Twilight Imperium Shattered Empire Expansion. For more reviews and previews, check back at Bowers Game Corner.